God's word, faithfully preached, is his comprehensive equipment for changing lives, delivering them from the shackles of sin, the flesh, and the world, and transforming them into useful vessels through whom Jesus can pour out his blessings. Living Seed invites you to a feast of the truth as God's servant brings to us the word of life. Hallelujah. I realize that there are things that are already lost to the body of Christ. That the new generation of believers don't even know such things exist again. God must raise people in whose life such things are currently happening so that the coming generation will not lose that virtue from the body of Christ. Am I communicating with you? So he raised apostles, he raised prophets. Those who have capacity to interpret the purposes of God, to make the invisible purposes of God visible for the young people to see. They are not just going about and saying, Oh, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Mm, the spirit says you are going to be promoted next month. No. <laughs> Let me inform you that you see the New Testament prophet is not the same as the Old Testament prophet. You see the Old Testament prophet has the monopoly of bringing the word of God because the spirit of God was not yet given generally. What made them prophets in those days that God specially appeared to them and there may be in a whole nation there will be one or two. So people went to seek the word of the Lord from their mouths. But you don't know. The Bible said in those days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. First Corinthians chapter, chapter 14. It says, Covet spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Do you now see that in the New Testament, to prophesy is not a specialty of anybody. But then to come into the office of the prophet in the New Testament is to have the ability to bring by the word of wisdom the invisible purposes of God bring it to become visible. And for all the children of God to be able to confirm with the spirit of God in them. So a New Testament prophet doesn't come to impose a New Testament prophet can't come and say, Thus says the Lord. God said you should give me a plot of land. No. 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 That's ignorance. Before you finish speaking, the Spirit of God in you should be able to tell him and say, Brother, it's not like that. God hasn't spoken to me yet. But you see, unfortunately, because People don't understand. They have only read about the way the Old Testament prophets operated. They want to go and operate it here now. Where the Holy Ghost is already given to all. So I keep discovering that there are so many men who are operating as if Christ has not come. They are setting up churches as if Jesus Christ has not come. It can't be correct. It's not right. What is a prophet of the New Testament to do? It is to equip the saints. 
not to intimidate them. Not to tie them to your apron and every time you say, oh, let's meet the prophet, let the prophet speak now, let the prophet speak now. No. And there are many women, you see, many of you women, you are going up and down looking for prophets who will prophesy to you. No. All of these aberrations that have come to the body of Christ because the word of God is becoming scarce. Diligent study of the word of God is dying out. You see, since we came, we have only been reading one chapter. Have we finished it? We cannot. That's the riches of the word of God. For us to sit down and say, let's dig into the treasure of the word of God. We don't have space for that anymore. Now, God is raising you up. Even when he gives you prophetic insight into scriptures, it is not to carve a space, a niche for yourself as the special man. It is to equip, to release, to ignite, and to focus the saints for the work of ministry. The evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, that's why they are there. And I said, they were not set on the church. Let's read the Bible again. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's read 1 Corinthians 12. Are you in 1 Corinthians 12? Eh? Now look at verse 28. 28. And God has done what? Had set some in. I want you to see the preposition. Those of you that carry King James. God has set some in, not on. If the Bible has said, and he had set some on the church, what would that have meant? They would have been above the church. And the church will have been under their feet. May I say to you, apostles, they are not above the church. Prophets, they are not above the church. Teachers, they are not above the church. Pastors, they are not on the church. How did he set them? He set some in the church. What does that mean? They are also in the church. They are part of the church. They are within the church. They themselves they are members of the church. Oh, you are not hearing me. When they have ministered, what do they do? They sit in. So that they also receive ministry. So he said some in the church. First apostles. Secondly prophets. Thirdly teachers. After that miracles. Then gifts of healings. Helps. Government. Diversities of tongues. Are all apostles. Eh? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? That's to show you that it is a divine placement in. So let me inform you now. I don't know whether you like to hear it. You are not above the church. You are not. 
don't take yourself above the church. The church is not under your feet. The church is bigger than you. You are in. You are just a member in the church. And when God has used you to supply the grace, the endowment with which he has given you, what do you do? Take your place. Where? In. So that the church all the different members can minister. They can also contribute their own grace to your life. A situation where as a church pastor you are on top there. Nobody speaks to your life. You are not doing well. A stage where you come over and you are the supervisor of everybody. You put your hand in the pocket. When they are praying, you are supervising their prayer. You are going to die very soon. You are going to kill yourself. Because you are struggling to edify people and you have no space where you are edified. That's what kills preachers. That's what makes many of us to run dry. You should be able to sit in the church and allow people to minister and take your notes. It may be a young man that you are the one who equipped him. When he is operating within the grace that God has given him, you must understand that that is not quite exactly your grace. There is something in him that you don't have. And you should be humble enough to do what? To collect it. Receive it. That's what will make you fresh. But you know the foolish things that has happened to many preachers is that they are on top there. Nobody ministers to them. They only come two minutes to the time when they are to preach. They think it's special anointing. It's a wrong mannerism. Sometimes he's sitting in the church office drinking tea and telling the ushers that when, when it is time, come and call me. You see, he is not in the fellowship. He is not in the spirit of what God is doing. He's coming from outside to speak to it. And once he finishes, as soon as he's finishing, you see the ushers. They quickly come and carry his Bible and carry everything and they will walk him out again. So he's walking out. He's going out there. So when he suddenly begins to fall into sin and to wither, you say, why? Because he has never been in the church. How many of you are humble enough to, be, to belong to a Bible study class in your church? How many of you are humble enough to come and sit in the Sunday school class as a member? <coughs> so that you just sit in, you are taking notes. As the young man is teaching, you are taking notes. You don't understand. He may just ask you to open a passage. He doesn't have grace to explain all that is in that passage. But God uses his little grace to link you to something that will be a bigger thing for your life. And as he just, he may have quoted the passage and he has gone. But you, inside that passage, something is breaking forth, breaking forth for your own life. 
can you humble yourself? He said, some in the church, not on. You are not above the church. No spiritual gifts, no ministry sets you above the church. You are not. You are in. You are a member. Honestly speaking, you just need to have your seat there. If it is possible, when you finish your ministration, come and sit down so that the word of God can face you. Don't be in a place where when the word of God is coming, the word of God is backing you. You are behind. Do you know that even in the correct, when you go even to an Anglican church, Correct church before things went wrong. When it is time for the ministry of the word, do you know that all the priests they ought to come down and sit under the word? You see, you forgot some of your tradition. If you are a correct Anglican, if you go back to study our liturgies, you will discover that when it comes to the word of God, when it comes to the ministry of the word, you are requested to come down and sit for the word. But you see, as we began to miss the purpose, we became more concerned about status to such a time that when the word of God is going on, you are still busy doing something else. You are misplacing yourself. He said somewhere in, not on. No ministry puts you above the church family. No. And your ministry is only enhanced as you are drawing nutrients from the body. Don't let the devil isolate you for slaughter. Part of the temptation that Satan brought to Jesus which he brings to every man of God. When you have overcome the temptation of making the stone to become bread, the lust of the flesh, the next thing he tempts you with is the pride of life. He took Jesus to the top of the temple. You see where he was trying to place him? He was placing him on the tower. On the pinnacle above, above the altar. Above the ark. And he said, since you are the son of God, come down here. As God now said, he will command his angels to carry you. Many times, when some of you think that you have been highly anointed, the devil tempts you to go to the pinnacle there. And he's asking you to fall down. That you are very important. That because of your ministry and because of the anointing, God will, God will be too concerned that he will set angels to carry you. No. You will break your backbone. <laughs> Jesus is the greatest that God gave the Holy Ghost without measure. He never did it. He told Satan, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. He knew 
that mm -mm, anointing does not put a man above the church. Don't be so highly anointed that nobody teaches you again. You see, Paul was a pioneer of most of the churches, isn't it? He founded the Ephesian church. He founded the... But do you know what he did? Once the church is gathered, two or three or four of them, you know what he did? He became a member. He sat. Sometimes they will have appointed local elders who were directing the church and he will be a member. And unless the local elder gives him permission to speak, he never spoke. Whenever they came, the elders who said, men and brethren, do you have anything to say? That was when Paul could stand up. For example, you can see John. John. John the Beloved. Eh? He was writing. Do you know he was writing about, I think in third John, he was writing about one man called, is it Diotiphrys or Demetrius? He said, Demetrius will not even allow us in the church. Ah, how can an apostle come to the fellowship and Demetrius will not give them chance? It's because they were so humble that they came in and sat in the church waiting for the local elder to give them chance if they have something to say or not. But you like this. If you went to any of the local parishes, no matter what the local vicar has prepared to preach, you know once you came in there, what did you do? You disrupted the whole thing. You took over. You can't sit in. You can't sit down. May I pray that God will help us to understand the principles by which God wants his church to grow in the name of Jesus Christ. I want you to see that there's a goal in the heart of Jesus Christ for the church till we all come. In the unity of the faith, I'm back in Ephesians 4.13. And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is what God is looking for. That as we are ministering, there's one thing we are looking at, that Christ might be formed in our members. Paul said, I travel again eh, as in birth until Christ is formed in you. So do you notice that for every people, every man, every woman that God brought under you, there's something God is wanting you to do. Equip them until they have come to the fullness of the stature of Christ. That's the job. It's a very serious job. That every man, Colossians 1, he says, to this end we labor. With all the energy of the, his energy that is at work in us. Whom we teach. Whom we preach and teach. In order to pre present every man. What? Perfect. The word perfect. If you read it in NIV, it says, to, prevent, to present every man matured in Christ. That's the plan. So every member of your church, you needed to sit back and say, Lord, how do I equip this man until I can present him mature in Christ? And as you are doing that to his life, you are teaching him to do it to someone else. So that throughout in the church, there is a kind of transfer of life going on. As you are discipling this one, he is also discipling others and like that until Christ be formed in them. Ephesians 4.14 Please help me read. 
414 from Living Bible and then from Amplified. Is the Amplified man here? Yes. All right, all right. Yes, go ahead, Sister Lizzie. We will no longer be like children. Forever changing our minds. You see? Did you notice that what has happened in the church is that people are just drifting. Today is fire anointing. Tomorrow is oil. Next week is water. Today they are going to a mountain. Tomorrow they are going to a pool. Just moving from one thing to another, from one thing to another, tossed to and fro as children. And this is all because the ministry of the word of God is being omitted. If you see how our church members have been drifted, if another man enters Umtata, now you see it, people will be running up and down. What is the reason? Because the truth of God's word has not been taught. Go ahead. Uh -huh. He has cleverly lied to us and made the cry sound like what? Like the truth. Now, amplified. Will you read that quickly? Verse 14. So then, we will no longer be children tossed like sheep to and fro between chance gas of teaching and wavering with every changing wind of doctrine. You see that? Chance gusts of teaching. Gamblers. <laughs> Gamblers. You know, it, does, it bothers me. I say, so, and Paul wrote about this over 2,000 years ago. Gamblers who came into the ministry just to make money. If you see the way they will speak with sugar-coated mouths, only to raise money. Gamblers. They will look for some passages that has no connection. And, you know, weave it about, weave it about. And so that you cannot think very well, they will interject it with some 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 psychological hype. You say, if anybody is, if you have sensing this, the move of the spirit there, shout hallelujah. So you will have shouted about one hundred hallelujah in twenty minutes. Some of you, you will have been jumping up. Some of you will come out here, dance around, doing like this, doing like this, doing like this. And some will just catapult and fall down because, because you are confused. Gamblers. But they will make it to appear as if that, that is the anointing. They will make it to look as if anointing necessarily has to do with noise, necessarily has to do with... with with emotionalism has to do with sentiments and all of that and so it will make you feel as if you are in one spirit but the truth is that once they come out you find that you have been robbed it does not leave you with any lasting experience of God gamblers with every sifting doctrine. Peter also wrote about them. 
in second peter chapter 2 speaking the truth in love we may grow up into him in all things which is the head even christ from whom so now let's conclude the church will not grow well until we link every member to the head brothers and sisters your greatest service to the kingdom of god is to let men know christ your greatest ministry is to let people get direct connection with christ and him crucified anything else you did that obscured christ from people you have cheated them it is christ who died it is christ who rose again it is christ whose blood washes us away from all our sins it is christ it is his resurrection that gives us hope it is his coming back that is the hope of the church and it is not those who do know their pastor that shall be strong it is those who do know their god that shall be strong and do exploits john the baptist says he must increase i must decrease the more christ increase in the lives in the heart in the understanding of your members and the more you decrease in their estimate because they have now met christ the better your ministry will be but you see the flesh say ah if they forget me if they don't respect me you don't know that it is more and more as people know christ that they will have a clear response to you that's at least that's my own experience my experience is that when I've labored and people have come to know Christ and they are connected to him and they began to enjoy Christ, that's when they even bring a clear respect to my life. I have found that it is as he increases and as I decrease that I have safety. I want you to know that all that we are sharing with you here, we are sharing it with all that is in us. Because if you succeed in your ministry, that's when I am blessed. When you go now and your ministry begins to break forth in the grace of God, in the power of God, it's not your money that will bless me. It is your growth that will bless me. So sometimes when we go to preach, we say, let's bless the man of God. And I say, but with what? <laughs> with what? And what, they are in, what is in their head is that they bless you with offering. I say, ah, no, you have cheated me. You have cheated me. When you want to kill a farmer who has just sown a seed, pluck out the seed and give it back to him. Woe unto that farmer who uproot his seed to eat it. When the time of harvest come, he will be hungry. When we cast the seed of the word of God into people's lives, it is when the seed are produced and they have become fruitful that we ourselves have something to eat from them. But every time you go to preach, as soon as you finish, nothing has happened to them. You say, okay, if, the, if you enjoy the message of the man of God, sow a seed. You don't know what you are telling them. You are saying, bring what he put in your life, throw it back to him. That's why many of you will not, you can't be blessed. It's never enough. 
You don't understand biblical principle. Do you know what the Bible said in Psalm 126? It said, that man that goes about weeping with precious seed, when the time of harvest come, it will doubtlessly come with what? Sheaves. Can I beg you, don't eat your seed. Can you go deliberately into the ministry to sow the seeds? You may be hungry for a while. Every farmer, there is a time of hunger. The time of planting, every farmer makes do with the barest minimum. Knowing that the time of harvest is coming. How many of you look that if you sow into people's lives, if you feed them with the word of God, if you train them, if you look well to the state of your flock, when the time comes, you will drink milk and it will never finish. But you are too concerned about eating your seed the day you sow it. To the extent that all the members, they have concluded now that it's about money. So when you finish preaching, they know that you won't stop until they put something. So they're already getting ready to get you some five rands to drop for you and say, let, let, just tell him so that he can go. You don't know that as they are doing that, what they are doing is that they are throwing back to you your seed. Brothers and sisters, don't eat your seed. Be diligent to sow the seed. Be diligent to understand the state of your flock. Be a shepherd who feeds the sheep, not the one that feeds on the sheep. I said your greatest ministry is to link them to the head. from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. You see, it is as each one of them begins to release the, the endowment of grace in their lives, what every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Did you see that now? It is as each one of them begin to release the grace according to the measure of every part that makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Your church will grow by the grace of God. Your church will blossom when you begin to release every gift. When you get back from this week. First, I want you to pray and set you into this. I want you to pray and say, Lord, I want to serve you according to your pattern. Begin to discover that I am here not to pastor these people forever. I'm here to equip them. Look for the few set of people that you want to begin with. Take them in and begin to say, Lord, how can I release the grace of God in these people? How can I equip them? Don't be ambitious to start with 200. Start with five. Take them in. But show them that as they see things in your life, they must go and do it to others. Very soon you will see. that you will just suddenly see that 
God is helping you to multiply usable hands in the church. And as they are beginning to grow, you will see them multiplying others. You see them growing and you are pouring and they are pouring and before you know it, the congregation is beginning to sense a new move of God. May God help us. May the Holy Spirit give you strength. Let me ask you the final question. Would you like to serve Jesus? Yes. Eh? Yes. In such a way that you will be happy. Yes. You can see that we need grace. Will you first please identify where is my space, my grace space? Because it is within your grace space that you have grace to grow the church and to grow in the church. Can you deliberately say, I'm no more struggling with people. I don't want to be everywhere. Let me be what you want me to be. If God has made you, listen to me, let's say God has given you special ability to teach the word of God. I want to, I'm just giving you an illustration. And you're an Anglican priest. You know by the virtue of the way the Anglican uh, church service is structured. If you don't deliberately take time, church service is full of activities that you may not have more than 20 minutes to preach. 15 minutes, 20 minutes. If you are very careful, you may be able to get about 30 minutes. But you know that there's not much you can bring about in that kind of atmosphere. What do you do? So that your grace of teaching does not die. Deliberately look for the midweek and put your strength there because that's where your grace is and start teaching. Suddenly you will discover that your Wednesday service will be as powerful as church at Sunday. The only difference is that the Sunday, Sunday church goers. Eh? But the core member of your church they will be with you when you are teaching the word. And before you know it, they will soon dominate the church. They will soon be the one in charge of the boys brigade. They will be in charge of the women group. They will be in charge of the youth. All of them. And they will carry the work. Suddenly you see your church bustling. Because you are now beginning to employ your grace to bring profit. Are you understanding? Can you please find out where is your grace space? And where is your endowment? That's what God has given you to make profit and to make your profiting appear to all. We will stop here and we'll commend you to God. That from this night, God will spark something in your spirit. By which the work under your hand will never suffer defeat. May the Lord help us. May the Holy Spirit, who himself has brought you to serve him, may he empower you to do well to the glory of his name. Let's pray together. Stand up as we pray together. Let's call on God. Let's say, Lord, tonight, you are going to help me. You have not brought me into the ministry to make me a failure. You will help me. Help me first to discover my grace space. Help me to discover the measure. I don't want to operate outside my measure. I don't need the energy of the flesh. I want to walk in the realm of the spirit. Let's pray. Natural talents, as good as they are, they don't have what it takes.
to grow the spiritual life of the church. Can you ask God that all your natural ability will be baptized, will be soaked, will be, will be swallowed in the anointing of the Holy Spirit that is far, far superior. Ask God, Lord, help me. Help me. Help me, Lord. Don't let your grace in my life, don't let it wither out, out of disuse. Don't let the gift you place in me, don't let it die out. Lord, help me. Help me, Lord, to bring profit to the body of Christ in my generation. Thank you. This has been Living Seed. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House. P.O. Box 971 Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036359, 0703 768119. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Make it a date with us next week.